think the market is pretty much priced this in at this point, right? There's a 0% probability, slightly less than 1% probability that there's going to be any actual movement. The Fed's not going to you know, upset the apple cart in that process. At the same time, I think everybody is expecting effectively a stern lecture on financial conditions <laughs> and that we you know, really should be more responsible in our thought process. Um, and I think that's going to be the underlying story, right? We saw with inflation today that the Fed is actually rapidly moving towards this objective of 2%. Some people would actually argue, myself included, that we're probably o going to overshoot to the downside. And that becomes the key question. But I think the, the one thing, if I were to make a quick observation, it's that everybody keeps pricing the markets off of 25 basis point moves. And that's a pretty good model when you're talking about hikes because the Fed tends to hike in a somewhat conservative fashion. It was a surprise when they did 75s and 50s, contributed to the volatility in 20, 2022. As we look at cuts, though, those actually have about a 50-50 chance, about equal probability of 50 basis point cuts. And so a lot of the statements around we're going to cut early, we're going to cut in the first quarter, I think are contingent on the idea that the only cut that can occur is a 25. I think it's more likely, actually, that we probably see a 50 later in the year, and that would suggest that the probabilities that the market has are not quite as crazy as people think, right? If we were to wait and be more patient and not cut in the first quarter, or certainly not January, but instead were to wait and cut in July, August, September, et cetera, and do so in 50 basis point increments, that would be consistent with pricing, also feels probably more accurate. So what happens in the first half of the year, though, from a market's perspective, if the Fed, as you said, kind of punts until there's a, called a jumbo cut in the summer? Well, that becomes the real question, right? Because what we, where we are today is in a very bifurcated market. If I'm Apple or if I'm a wealthy you know, U.S. individual, I'm celebrating the fact that interest rates are higher because I've got a significant amount of cash on my balance sheet or in my bank accounts. I'm suddenly earning a really attractive return on that. And with the retreat in inflation, that makes me feel much wealthier. If I'm a senior citizen, I've benefited from a 8.3% increase in Social Security this year that now looks like one of the greatest giveaways in history, right? So when we think about it from that perspective, actually, if the Fed starts to cut, it becomes actually a problem for those entities. On the flip side of the equation, we're seeing from things like the NFIB small business uh, surveys that credit availability is not loose for small businesses, that small businesses are really struggling. And the lower income Americans who need access to credit to pay their daily bills, they're also really struggling using credit cards, 30 percent interest rates, et cetera. So this is a very bifurcated market, and it really becomes an interesting question of do we get to the point where something breaks and the Fed is forced to do this? Or as many, particularly, that are active in the Fed, you know, Fed researchers, et cetera, are kind of hoping for it as the Fed behave in a proactive fashion. I think the odds of that are low. Hey, Mike, you've been doing this uh, a long time. Equities, credit, FX, commodities, all that kind of stuff. If we're in a higher for longer kind of range here, I mean, I guess we'll start cutting at some point this year. Where do you see some of the best opportunities right here, just across asset classes? Well, I, I think that there's a couple of interesting things that have happened that suggest as we particularly come into uh, the presidential election year that the opportunity is relatively limited for Biden to goose the economy once more. Yep. And so some of the areas that have fallen deeply out of favor would include areas in green investment, things tied to the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, I would actually point to some of those as having fallen significantly enough that now as a contrarian play, they become somewhat interesting, some of the lithium plays, et cetera. Mm -hmm. On the flip side of that, and, and just to be very clear, the Inflation Reduction Act, terribly named because it can be used <laughs> to stimulate the economy, right. but it, you know we have to actually acknowledge that that will be one of the goals going into 2024. Um, the other thing that I would highlight is, is that we've now seen a really interesting event where Xi has made the pilgrimage to Mecca, right? Yep. And that, I think, is, it, you know, as we're seeing in the weakness of the Chinese economy, that was something I called for earlier in the year that certainly borne out. A lot of people had expected this China, you know, giant China rebound on a China reopening. We're now seeing that their economy is very structurally weak. The is fact that, that something that, that continues into 2040, do you think? Well, that becomes the interesting question, because unfortunately, this is a situation with both in which both Xi and Biden need to stimulate their yep. economy. They need to figure out ways to make sure that we don't go into deeper economic drawdowns that could be proved problematic for each of them. For Biden, it would mean a failure to be reelected, or for the Democratic Party, it would mean a failure to be reelected if Biden doesn't stand. For Xi, it has far more dire yep. consequences. He goes out with his boots on. And so does that present an opportunity, you're saying, within Chinese equities? I, I think or? it's interesting if you look at some of the Chinese equities, for example, if you look at the large cap Chinese ETFs or you look at the... Like the uh, FXI is what you're looking FXI at? FXI would okay. be an interesting example of that, as would you know, Asher, for example. Um, those are interesting contrarian opportunities where the pricing is, I would argue, um, 
underappreciated in the potential for a stimulus type rebound. Gotcha. Just to call that out, the FXI has returned uh, a loss of 15% this year yeah. in the way in the face of ESPX being up. Twenty one percent. So right, with without about, recovering yeah. in twenty twenty two, right. Yeah. So it's not like it's a reversal from last year. It's been down fairly significantly. How about just kind of the U.S. versus international versus emerging markets? Where do you see kind of the best, I guess, risk reward here? Well, China certainly falls into the potential for an emerging market rebound, yep. and we are kind of at this situation where, if I look at things like oil prices, et cetera, they've retreated significantly. Many people were very bullish on it going into this year. Obviously, that's failed to materialize. That suggests that the growing consumption out of places like the emerging markets has been weaker than anticipated. We've seen supply cuts rather than dramatic additions, U.S. production being the notable exception there. Um, if I look at the emerging markets, you know, they clearly have growth potential. India is obviously mm -hmm. benefiting from picking up from China there, and, and I would highlight that that is the notable outlier in the emerging market space. But if I look elsewhere around the world, um, a China slowdown is really problematic for the emerging markets, and so you can get a momentary bounce. But if we're really looking at kind of the much broader picture of how this develops, we're now in this uncomfortable time period where it's about how do we change supply chains as compared to how do we dramatically expand them as we did under the China regime. And so I think emerging markets continue to be challenged. They continue to be in a situation where particularly with very strong U.S. dollar against emerging markets and high interest rates, it's becoming harder and harder for people to justify investment in many of those regions. If we can stay internationally, what's your view on the UK and Europe? It just feels like, again, you pointed to Bloomberg TV talking about the IPO market. For all intents and purposes, Europe is nil in that front. Well, I think something really interesting is happening in Europe in that they're suddenly actually facing the same thing that they did with Japan in 1989, right? So if you look at the 1980s, Europe enjoyed quite a bit of schadenfreude at the idea of the United States becoming, you know, second fiddle to Japan. You saw that exact same type of schadenfreude as it related to China. And what changed it, of course, was Japan began going after the European auto market. Same thing's happening right now. China going after the European auto market, I would argue, has been one of the key catalysts in changing the tenor and tone of behavior towards China. I think that's one of the reasons why China is slowly backing away from some of its aggressiveness on trade. Um, on the flip side of it, Europe itself is just so structurally challenged that it becomes a really interesting question of how far does it have to go before change actually starts to emerge. And we just have not seen an incredible amount of emphasis on growth in Europe. They've effectively tried to mim you know, limit the amount of damage to the euro, limit the amount of damage to their economy from terrible choices they made around energy in particular over the last decade. And to change that is going to require a radical reimagination re of Europe where they try to go for growth as compared to preserving something that really can't be preserved anymore.